Thank you, and it's great to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, as you'll see, I haven't exactly left um, NIH, as I'm still um, using the template uh, from uh, the time that I was here in the intramural research program. And largely, I'm doing that because it's only fair. Much of what I'm going to be talking about today really was the work that I did here. Um, I'm now a chair and spend a lot of time doing administration. Um, but I, I will sort of point to some things that I'm looking forward to in the future. So today's lecture, um, first I have no financial interest to disclose. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I think, the importance of doing translation research. I'm going to build a case for that, I think, um, in terms of applying what we're learning in genomics to public health problems. I'm going to give you an overview, kind of a tutorial, because I'm going to assume that many of you in the audience aren't that familiar with intervention research and, pu and public health, give you sort of an overview of the social and behavioral research approaches that we use. Um, I'm going to talk about why do public health, even though um, we have to do interventions that may be of lower dose, and then give you some um, examples of translation research areas to sort of tease you, tantalize you, get you excited about um, the thought of doing this kind of research yourself or at least being a part of an interdisciplinary team who would be doing this. And then I'll just share some take-home messages. So why do, um, why do uh, start thinking about translation research now? And I think um, in 2003, when the sequence of the human genome was completed, there was a lot of concerns that we would wind up, well, how would we ever um, apply this optimally? Lots of concerns that this pile of data that we received would get lost in translation, we wouldn't know how to use it, and it would take years and years and years to figure that out. Some of that, I think, is looking like it may be true. Um, premature translation was the other concern. Direct-to-consumer uh, tests were coming out, and um, there was a lot of concern that that was happening before the public was ready, before the science was ready. Uh, so the big question, the burning question, I think, that all of us in translation research are sort of groping or grappling with is um, what is optimal application, and how do we do the research to support that? So the, the famous example is the direct-to-consumer marketing. Um, I like to do a lot of what I call, let's talk about suppositions, because if you look at the popular press, you look at our colleagues in the field, a lot of them are talking about making big prognostications about what's going to happen with genomics and how it's going to really revolutionize health, and that term is actually used. Um, and that sort of the, the public sector, or private sector, excuse me, got on the bandwagon about that and developed this uh, direct-to-consumer marketing, which was highly controversial. And in one iteration of this, there was a, a consideration that direct-to-consumer marketing would be offered in Walgreens stores, direct-to-consumers. Individuals could buy a testing kit off the, off the shelf and do their own um, genetic testing and send that into a lab and get their results. Uh, and there was the FDA sort of said, no, absolutely no, this can't happen. Um, and this decision was based on no data no data at all, just a sense of, of great harm that was perceived based on um, ethical, legal, and social implications. I would argue that these kinds of decisions should be made based on data. So where, what is the data? And this was actually um, done in 2007, but the landscape hasn't changed when we look at what data there is out there to, to guide some of these decisions about translation. You see here this big blue area is bench basic science, human genomics. And this little blue area down here is anything that could even loosely smack of uh, translation research. Um, and a teenier, teenier part would be related directly to health services delivery and improvement of health, public health. So why is that? Why is, has translation lagged so slowly behind um, discovery? Uh, I think some of it is how we think about science and how it should be done. Um, and the sort of notion that it's a linear, a linear um, model, that we start with basic research, then we, we um, develop some kind of a treatment that can be an intervention, um, and then we test it under the most tightly controlled circumstances we can, um, really not reflecting reality at all to prove that it can work. Then at, we, we then test it in a larger, less controlled situation to see if it's effective once it's rolled out. Um, and then at the very end, we try to actually use it in, in the public. Um, and in fact, our incentive structure for research is structured exactly the same way. If you see that um, we have these elements of T1, T2, T3, T4, now we're getting to T5s and T6s, 
um, that talk about uh, that this is, the, this is the way, it reifies this assumption that this is how it should be. I think that actually translation research sort of challenges that, um, and there's a resistance to that challenge. And it basically says, let's start where there are gaps, let's start where there are problems, challenges, unmet needs. Um, think about how the discovery, anticipate how the discovery might fit those needs. I think adherence is a huge issue. Pharmacogenomics is sort of pushing on that. I think intervention research could be focusing on that as well. That, that we then um, use that to guide our basic science priorities, our treatment development, and our um, and efficacy and effectiveness are sort of bundled together. So a few years ago, um, I think it was at the 10th anniversary of the completion of the sequence of the human genome, uh, the, there was sort of a decision to sort of advance, start to think more uh, thoughtfully about uh, what was genomics and society research. A group of us here at NHGRI got together, intramural, extramural, had long discussions and debates about let's define this field. And I think what you'll see is um, we came out of it sort of defining a discipline and then talking about all the methods that can be used in that, in that arena. And you can see here that the, the disciplines that get tapped into are quite broad in the social sciences um, across a, a, a wide gamut of social sciences. And the methods, too, are quite diverse, um, ranging from quanti qualitative methods, which I'll talk a little bit about today. I'm sorry, I'm going to get lost in my um, focus groups being, am I not working? Yeah, qualitative um, surveys, uh, structured interviews. Uh, archival research, community-based research I'll talk a little bit about. So a broad array of methods that um, we can use. Those also take us to uh, um, involve transdisciplinary methods just by virtue of the number of disciplines involved. Social science isn't monolithic any more than basic science is. And, and then from that, we get a number of outputs from basic knowledge, just as basic science does, all the way up to public policy. So, before I get started, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and using the same language around what is an intervention. Um, and when we talk about an intervention, we're basically talking about anything that we do that's directed at a target group that's defined somehow to influence a desired outcome. And those outcomes can range from individuals' decision making about health uh, healthcare options. It can be group or individual behavior change, things like smoking cessation, dietary change, improving exercise, adherence to medications. It can be um, attitude change or individual or group attitude change, changing beliefs, misconceptions about health because we know what people believe influences what they think the solutions are to um, become healthy, and then um, as well as public policy change. Also, when we think about interventions, they um, span a, a, a spectrum from primary prevention to tertiary, so primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So with primary prevention, we're talking about healthy populations that we're working with and we're where the goal is to prevent illness or injury. Um, secondary, and, and the, the, the corollary to that in terms of genetics and translation research would be in susceptibility testing, tailoring interventions to those who are already healthy. Secondary prevention is really the early detection, testing, surveillance of risk, and that really would, would be, in the genomics arena, would be predictive testing of high-risk groups, um, newborn screening being another uh, element of that. And then the goal there is to identify disease early and do things to um, improve the health outcomes, long-term health outcomes. And then there's tertiary um, intervention or, or prevention, which is those who already have the condition and you're trying to help them manage the, the, the condition and, and be as healthy as they can living with that condition. And in the genetics arena, that would be assisting those who are already affected with a, dis with a disease, in particular rare diseases, where there's a lot of um, sequelae in the area of breast cancer, for exa example, long-term tamoxifen use. So the, I think that what distinguishes in many respects, or at least what we think distinguishes social and behavioral science from many of the other sciences, is that when we design interventions or research studies, it's guided by theory. And the theories are numerous, <laughs> as you can see here, um, but, and that they also map to different levels of influence. So we can talk about theories to when we're trying to influence an individual's health outcomes or health behaviors. We can talk about um, theories that involve interpersonal, so dyadic or, or small groups. We can talk about organizations, healthcare delivery systems, schools, um, churches are often targeted. And then we can talk at the societal level, which is policy. 
So this is all to say, this is sort of the toolkit, this is the science of social and behavioral uh, research that we would then bring to these challenges of, of translating genomic applications. Now, again, when I say translation, I think what I probably need to always add <laughs> at the head of that is anticipation of translation. So even if we don't have the perfectly figured out genomic application, we could still be figuring out ways that we would translate what we might learn. And I think, the, and, and that there's a bi-directional aspect of that where we're then shaping some of the basic science and the discovery that happens. So when we talk about models, when we talk about theory, what we typically do is we sort of have a category of outcomes, whatever that behavior change or whatever that level of intervention is that we're targeting. We usually hypothesize there's some sorts of mechanisms that we're trying to influence that the intervention will likely target, things like what people believe, their skill set, um, we give them incentives and so forth. And then we also all really consider the background, um, the context in which this is all happening. It all looks really simple when you look at it this way, but if you look at a particular, any particular theory and one that I've used a lot is information processing theories, how individuals respond to information they get and whether they believe it and process it and think about it and use it, um, you can quickly see that it gets very complicated um, and that typically what we try to do is measure every level of these kinds of, or at least the levels that we think are most relevant or the levels that we think are amenable to intervention. We typically try to measure those um, to, influence, to understand how people are responding to the messages that we provide. So, um, shifting now to thinking about why public health. So, a couple of years ago, I guess it's been, gosh, 10 years ago, wow. Whew. Anyway, um, there we, we, a group of us got together to talk about um, priorities for translation research. And what we as a group of social scientists um, and social and behavioral scientists agreed was that if we were really going to optimize applications of genomics, the best things that we could do would be to, that prevention is key, that we should get our populations early. Dealing with chronic disease is expensive, difficult, and, and often doesn't result in improvements. That, that the major driver of, of public health in this country are risk behaviors um, that are poorly addressed, diet, physical activity, and smoking being three big ones. That, that anything that we do, anything that genomics brings to these public health interventions has to be amenable to applications in a public health arena, which often has very little infrastructure and is really favors low-cost solutions, or primary care, where the structure is quite busy, time-limited, and so we have to keep that context in mind as we're shaping these new discoveries. The question will always be, under those circumstances, does genomics, whatever it is, add value to what's currently there? If it doesn't add value, the healthcare providers won't pay any attention to it, and neither will the public health community. And then we also have to consider the fact that we're operating in a, in a world of widespread health disparities, and there's a lot of skepticism about whether or not any of these new translation will, will exacerbate those, those disparities. So we need to be very mindful of that. And, and at best, anything that we do that we bring to this would actually reduce health disparities. That would be the ideal. But unfortunately, when we look at public health um, interventions, we, we take this efficacious intervention that we've tested under the most highly controlled circumstances, and then we put it out in the real world. And it often, it's, it's up against some pretty big um, challenges. And when we look at it, we're always then in this, con in this question of as we're testing new things and trying to develop new things, of balancing efficacy against effectiveness. And really what we want to do is find the sweet spot where we're actually maximizing the reach because the more people that we can give even a mildly effective intervention to, the better, the, the greater the likelihood that we'll have a public and health impact. And I want to make sort of an, um, some examples of that. So if you think about um, the rare disease model, and I think the one that is actually really relevant today um, to uh, community settings is HNPCC, genetic counseling. Um, that right now is listed as a uh, top priority. Many of the health departments around the country are trying to, to consider how they can, they can expand reach of genetic counseling 
um, and identify those who are at high risk for these rare cancers, but those that can be um, amenable to screening um, and, Im and improve health outcomes. So currently the approach is, and, and this may have changed a little, but the current approach in the clinical setting, uh, clinical genetic setting, is that these are relatively high dose approaches. So there's a genetic counseling session in which family history is taken, and um, there's some counseling around whether or not genetic testing is appropriate. It's resource intensive in the sense that it requires a certified genetic counselor. We know in this country there are, very, there are relatively few of those, and they do not reach out into the rural settings of the U.S. There are face-to-face -face sessions requiring the clients to come in, which can, be, um, can meet with a lot of uh, challenges for those individuals. So it would be very, de de very demanding to try to sustain this or scale this up across the nation um, because of the reasons I'm saying, and it's also quite expensive. So it might be very efficacious, and in fact, I think that it would be regarded as an efficacious intervention, but it has extremely low reach. So if you take a public health approach to this, um, the standard uh, public health intervention is a low-dose intervention, um, less than an hour, generally even less than 30 minutes. Uh, this is resource light. It means that it can be implemented by a community health worker, a clinic staff, health educators. Um, much of the, the public health interventions rely on telephone, mail, internet, um, not face-to-face. -face. Uh, it has to be sustainable, <clears throat> so it has to be built into whatever is the existing infrastructure that is there to be used, and it has to be inexpensive because most of these, are, of these settings have very little infrastructure. Here, effectiveness is the goal, and reach is the most important um, benefit. So how can that work to our advantage? So the current approach, if we think it has really high efficacy, 80% will be improved in some way by being exposed to that intervention. But the reach is really poor. Only 10% of those who are really, who might benefit from this service will ever see it or get it. We see that we can really have an effectiveness of only about 8%. Contrast that to a public health approach um, where we say we have efficacy that's actually quite low. Maybe only 20% of the people uh, benefit from it to a gold standard of some setting. But the reach is much broader. 50% will actually get exposed to it we can see that we can actually, even with a less effective intervention, have a much broader effectiveness impact. So now I want to just turn to some examples of the research that um, I think, you know, a lot of this is work that I've been doing um, and some of my colleagues in the audience, and uh, just sort of to get, give you a sense of the kind of areas where I think we could be beginning to do, anticipate uh, ways to use genomics. So the three that I'm going to focus on today are sort of public understanding and use of genomic information, um, the potential for um, genomics to improve risk communication that can then increase the efficacy of health behavior change, and then using um, genomics to tailor kind of more of the precision, I'm going to refer to it as precision public health for, for, this, in, um, for this discussion, but the idea that we would be customizing our intervention approaches to um, individual genomic characteristics. So again, thinking about the suppositions, um, when I came to the, to the NHGRI in 2003, um, there was just the sort of inklings that the direct-to-consumer um, testing was on the horizon. Uh, Larry Brody and I were having tea every uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon, and in those conversations, uh, he was a human genetics person, I was a social behavioral scientist, we sort of concocted this idea that, well, gee, if it's coming, why don't, we, why don't we develop something to address some of the suppositions that we were seeing um, coming up in the, in the popular press? And those suppositions really were that the public really couldn't handle genetic information, um, and if they got genetic information without genetic, intensive genetic counseling, they would be downplay the behavioral contributors and it would backfire and it would undermine their motivation to, be, to lead healthier lifestyles that um, most of the individuals that would be targeted by these low, low probability susceptibilities would misunderstand them, either uh, inflate them or, or downgrade them in ways that would also contribute to these negative outcomes. The big thing from the healthcare delivery system was that healthcare providers just would not be able to manage the, the tsunami of patients that would be coming in the door to seek out these results. 
and that that would result in inappropriate use of health care, physicians feeling pressure to, assign, to uh, ask for tests and give services that the patient really didn't need. These are all testable assertions. Um, no one was doing it. Uh, so we launched the Multiplex Initiative. Multiplex Initiative was to develop a prototype genetic susceptibility test that would look somewhat like, obviously way more simplified than what the current genetic uh, susceptibility test, the 23andMe test, for example, looked like. But we developed this test based on the, the, the evidence base that was out there. We brought in experts to guide us and read the literature and tell us which test we, they could say with a straight face really was associated with even a small probability of increased risk for these common health conditions. And we, we identified eight common health conditions, as you can see here, um, and 15 genes that at that time, it was about 2005, 2006, had the evidence base, many of these have not changed, had the evidence base to um, be put into one of these tests. And the methods for this are described in this publication. You can read more about how we got to that test. We used, at the, the time and still, evidence-based um, approaches for risk communication. I'm just giving you an example here of this is the way that we use these, this information in the consenting materials so that individuals knew what they were getting into when they signed on to the study. And we use these materials as part of their test result communications. Basically, what it's showing here is that if you have the KCNJ11, uh, you have, there's three possible what we call risk versions or variants and what your risk would be if you fall into one of these categories, and using these sort of people um, designs to give you the, 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 the trade-offs. Now, obviously, what you can see is that there are very, very small increases in risk, only about six in 100 difference between the, the no variance and the three. So very small probabilities. We also told them uh, what how common it was to fall into one of these categories to help them ground their, their risk assessments, their personal risk assessments. This was um, a collaboration between, that was funded by the, uh, that was rolled out and partially funded by the NCI Cancer Research Network. Um, and we worked specifically with Henry Ford Health System in Detroit because they had a demographically diverse population. And we had a survey coordinator in Seattle that was part of the CRN. Um, and we targeted healthy adults, those who were ages 25 to 40 who didn't have any of these health conditions and um, because we wanted to, to test this for, um, for that health promotion prevention, primary prevention domain. Here's what the feedback looks like that they received using public health approaches, mail. Um, we mailed them their test results and, um, and told them, made sure that they understood or tried to make sure that they understood was a kit, a little uh, by a multi uh, sheets of paper that basically said we wanted to make sure that they understood that it wasn't just genes, that these accounted for a very small probability. We followed it up with um, telephone counseling by a trained health educator with no background in genetics. Um, we trained them through uh, multiple sessions. Um, so here is the, the flow. We identified the Henry Ford uh, through the Henry Ford Health System. Uh, so we, have a, we had a uh, denominator, um, population-based denominator. We conducted a baseline survey with these individuals. We provided them access to a website. They went onto the website, and that's where they consented, read the materials. And then they scheduled a clinic visit to come in and get blood. We could do now saliva, but then we were adamant we needed to do blood. And uh, we provided them with the results. I think it was about eight weeks afterwards, eight to 12 weeks afterwards. And then three months later, we did a follow-up survey. And, at, and within a week of them getting their results, someone was on the telephone with them trying to explain to them the test results. So our first supposition was that, that people, if they are given genetic information, will inflate uh, or, or downgrade their beliefs about behavior. What you can see here are the, common, the conditions across the bottom that we tested for. The behavior bars are, are how much do you think your health behaviors influence these health outcomes. The red bars are their behavior. The blue bars are their genetics. What you see across the board is behavior trumps genetics in these individuals' minds. Variant and variations in literacy. I'm sorry, I'm not showing the population, but um, uh, high school educated to college educated, nice uh, distribution of education levels. So this is not a, a highly literate population necessarily. Um, and what you can also see is that they can they can discern the nuances in in genes and environments. So for lung cancer, for example, our public health campaigns talking about smoking and its association with lung cancer appears to be noting that behavior 
and there is a nice behavior there that's associated with lung cancer and a downgrading genetics, but probably appropriately. So this, and, and this has been shown again and again in, these, in population based surveys of uh, that genetic literacy or this notion that somehow information about genetics will trump behavioral uh, contributors is, is, is false. We also wanted to see this sort of this test, this notion of the tsunami. Is there going to be so many people that will seek out the testing that it will overwhelm the system? And what you can see here is that of the 1,959 who we surveyed and were eligible, only 612 went to the website even to consider the testing. This was free testing, so this was even a model that isn't exactly replicable in um, the real world. Uh, of that, about half wanted testing. And of the half who wanted testing, only a, a slightly lower number, actually about 90 more, less, um, showed up to actually have their blood drawn, so sort of a passive refusal. And what you see here is that that accounts for about, of the baseline that were approached and offered the testing, only 14% got tested. So the notion, again, that individuals would be, you know, really sort of excited about getting this kind of low probability information um, may be inflated. Lastly, did they go to their health care provider? Did they talk to their health care provider about this information? Um, and what you can see here is this is who they shared their test results with. Um, and I want to say that we kept the testing and the, the participation in the study completely separate from their health care delivery system. So we didn't have any, it was all done by this uh, outside survey company that did the, did the interviewing, and we didn't include health care providers other than telling them the study was going on. We didn't tell them anything about their patients or who was being tested or not. So um, concerns about privacy, this was all in patient empowered. The patient was the one that would have to go talk to the health care provider. What you can see here is that they talked to their family, their spouse. Oh, am I getting it? Yeah. <laughs> they talked to their spouse and their family, um, and they were only as likely to talk to the health care provider as they were to their friends. So again, not a sense of them um, charging the fort. Lastly, we looked at healthcare utilization. So we had this nice data that was available through the, through the managed care organization on healthcare utilization, actual utilization. So we looked to see, did, did getting tested and getting test results increase healthcare utilization in the ways that would be concerning about costs? What you can see here is that those who um, just completed the baseline survey are the dashed line. And this is starting their utilization starting four quarters before testing. This is where they were tested and then continuing four quarters after their testing. And what you can see here is that those who did the baseline only were the lowest utilizers um, and they stayed straight, stayed flat. And um, the, the ones who did the web only, so they went on, they thought about testing, but they, they didn't get tested. There was sort of some bouncing that went on. And what, what the takeaway is that the multiplex tested, which were at the top, were high utilizers to begin with, and they stayed high utilizers afterwards. So this idea that it was going to change um, their, it may just be that those worried well or healthy are the ones that are more uh, attracted to this kind of testing, but, but probably not at least going to bump up their utilization in the ways that we've been very concerned about. So this is the kind of science that we can be doing in parallel or ahead of these kinds of discoveries. So the, the second area that really has gotten a lot of attention in terms of where would genomics really revolutionize um, uh, healthcare delivery is this idea that it's going to motivate behavior change, that learning something personal about you is going to inflate or greatly increase your motivation to change health behaviors. So here we see a theoretical model. I'm just taking an amalgamation of the models that are often uh, used in, in looking at motivation to say that genetic risk communication is somehow going to influence uh, behavior change. So what the thinking is is that it's going to increase perceptions of susceptibility because it's so personal. This is your genome. This is, uh, and that's going to be so relevant to you motivationally that you will want to take up um, precaution, pr precautions to uh, improve your health. Um, the downside of this and the contradiction to this, because the other concern is that it will, it will demoralize people, um, is that it will make it seem uncontrollable. After all, it's genetics, you can't do anything about it, and it will lower confidence to change. And then you have a lot of other factors that you have to consider, um, whether or not a person can understand the information, their disposition, their attitudes and beliefs that are in the background, do they believe in genetics or not. And then there are other motivations, and then there's always context that we have to think about. 
um, as well in terms of where is the testing being done, how is the frame in which um, it's, it's being received, how's that influencing the frame. And that somehow is going to influence motivation, increase motivation or decrease motivation. So the early studies were done in smoking cessation. I, would, I was among a group that, that did those. The first one, though, was Karen Lehrman at Georgetown. And, and she looked at, a, at CYP2D6 as giving that to smokers as a way to motivate them to quit smoking. CYP2D6 is about how you process nicotine. And um, most people um, fall into the category of, of high processors. So almost everybody got the message that you were at risk. That was the earliest study so the, because of ethical concerns. And as you can see here, there was no effect on cessation at short-term cessation or long-term cessation based on getting that genetic test. Um, my colleagues and I selected GSTM, which is also involved in metabolizing nicotine. And that is that the nice uh, thing about that marker is that 50% of the population fall into sort of the high metabolizers and 50% of the population fall into the low, the not high metabolizers. And so you can have this nice comparison of does it do something harmful? If you get the message that, hey, don't, you, know, you, you don't have to worry as much, does that diminish smoking cessation motivation? And what you can see here is, again, providing that, um, that piece of information didn't have any effect on cessation at 6, 12, or continuous. Um, so, so basically, there were a couple of, uh, since that time, there have been several reviews. And most recently, uh, Teresa Marteau has done another Cochrane database to say, this isn't working. This giving a genetic risk information to an individual to get them to change their smoking, their diet, um, it is, is not showing any effect across the studies. I would argue, you know, some people say, hey, roll up the tent, go home, we're done. This isn't going to work. Um, I think there's lots of reasons why this hasn't worked. Um, I wouldn't say, I think it's maybe necessary to we We're going to have to communicate about genetics, I think, to individuals for at least for a good long time. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's sufficient to get people to change their behaviors. And there's lots of reasons why. One of it is that, just going back for a minute, is that in both of these cases, most people who show up for smoking cessation interventions, it's the last ditch effort. They're highly motivated. They're looking for something novel. I think in, in terms of behavior change generally, that's what you're going to see. So the idea is to try to identify these populations that really where motivation is, is not as high and see if we can get um, them to see if these, these risk communications have a bigger effect there. Um, what you see, what we did when I first got to the Genome Institute was um, to look at whether we could identify younger members of families who were smokers and use work that I had been doing in the teachable moment to see if we could optimize the teachable moment by providing, by including um, genomic risk information. So in this case, we looked at family members of those who'd been identified with patients who'd been identified with late stage lung cancers. So these patients were likely going to die within a three months time frame. And we approached their biological family members to ask them if they wanted, who were smokers, to ask them if they wanted to undergo genetic testing. We, un, we decoupled it from a cessation intervention. So we're not trying to get you to quit smoking. We said that upright. Up, upright. We just want you to um, see, if, see if you want to learn more about your risk with the thinking being that we would attract more people who had lower motivation and therefore perhaps have more room to move uh, with our risk communications. So this was a revolutionary at the time in that we were the first to be actually doing it online. Um, so people logged on, got their test results online, sent in a spit kit, and, um, and, and that hadn't been done. Now it's, it's standard. But, but unfortunately, again, what we see, here are the characteristics of those who logged on and didn't log on, small sample. Um, those who logged on had a 6.3 on a 7-point scale of motivation to quit smoking. So again, we were attracting, compared to those who did not log on, who were the lower motivated. So again, what we find is that we, even in this situation, we were attracting the most motivated, those individuals who really um, probably were feeling like maybe this will do it, maybe this will be the thing that will convince me. And likewise, we didn't show, we offered, so we, at the end of the risk communication, even though we said it's not a smoking cessation intervention, we offered them smoking cessation um, help if they wanted it. And here's the uptake. Um, we offered them nicotine replacement therapy, and almost all of them took that. It didn't matter what their test result was, whether they were in the lower risk or the higher risk category. We offered them self-help guides. Um, most of them took that. These are the, this is sort of the standard of care for smoking cessation. 
The only difference we saw, and it wasn't significant, was that more of those in the higher risk category signed on for something that was fairly intensive, six telephone counseling calls, and, and those are associated with cessation rates. But we didn't see any difference in cessation. Not surprisingly, it really wasn't a cessation intervention. So the take home message is that the motivated are showing up, so using this as a tool for motivation, eh, maybe not the best investment. But how do we get to the people who aren't motivated if, that, if we want to use this as a tool? And so we have to think about what are the optimal contexts for that. And when we think about that from a public health standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to go with the lowest dose we can because it's going to be the cheapest and have the broadest reach. And we're trying to, to get people who are not as highly motivated because that's where we can have the bigger potential influence on. So we're looking on that curve somewhere for what's the optimal place to time the genomic information. Who's the, what are the optimal populations? And when it comes to smoking, I think some of the thinking is that we should be going younger to younger smokers, like college-age smokers. And so we did. We subsequently, after that study, started a study with college uh, smokers in North Carolina, several uh, historically black colleges, Duke and UNC to look at primary prevention um, among college smokers. We had also done some work before I came to the Genome Institute looking at whether college smokers at a historically black college were interested in uptake of genetic testing. And they told us that they were only interested in, in finding out that they were at low risk, which again supports that notion that they might be looking for ways to get permission to keep smoking. So we knew we were going to have to, we were going to have to, um, to, 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 to target that. And then we used our conceptual model was the pr protection motivation theory, which is basically it's what are the motives that get people to seek out actions to um, like uh, a smoking cessation program. What we found in our baseline data, um, and this was just an interim, um, this study is still going on amazingly, um, is that we were, it does look like we were finding the sweet spot. Um, of those surveyed at baseline, the mean desire to quit was only 3.8 on a seven-point scale, so we're looking much better when we see the other population was the lowest was five, um, that most of them have sort of the belief that they can quit any time, so they're, they're downplaying addiction and the addiction properties of tobacco, and that most of them are believing that the harms of smoking are far in the, in the future. So this seems like this could be a really good group to be thinking about risk communication. So this is some of the qualitative data. Um, I don't have the outcomes yet. Uh, that's still in process. But uh, what we see here is that it, I think it does give us some notions about where we might go forward. So you see that some of what they were saying is on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm a 2 on worry. Um, smoking helps me with school, with the stress. I'm hearing these public health messages that are telling me that my lungs, once I quit, my lungs are going to repair within two years or something like that. So I figure I can, you know, get through college and then in graduate school, my lungs will, you know, I can quit smoking and my lungs will be great. Um, so the sense that, again, these generic public health messages, this may be, the, this may be another toehold for our risk communications. These generic health messages, um, public health messages, can be backfiring when we see there's variability in the population um, in terms of their understanding about some of these uh, genetic, genetic susceptibility. So the two leverage points that we were thinking about for genetic risk communication is that, one, young smokers don't really understand that those who are susceptible need less exposure to get, to get the illness. So there's an area of gene environment risk communication that we could be talking about. Um, currently, we just talk about genetic risk. And that they also underestimate the potential for addiction, and we know that there are lots of uh, genetic risk variants out there that can give us insights into propensity for addiction. So perhaps maybe then, rather than looking at risk communication in terms of a health outcome like lung cancer that does happen for most in older ages, we should be looking at things that are more proximal um, in these kids' minds. And we could be using lots of the social media and other strategies for doing that. Again, bringing our translation research ideas to those environments could be very useful in terms of thinking about risk communication uh, refinements. So then the next area we think about is going even younger, um, trying to get as early in, the, in terms of risk communication as possible. And, uh, you know, we all have heard about the obesity epidemic, uh, epidemic and we know where that, that's starting in kids and that we're seeing larger numbers of very young children who are already showing signs of, of uh, markers for diabetes and, hi and hypertension. So this is a major area, thinking about where we could be bringing new um, innovation to it. 
and colleagues of mine and I here at the genome did take that on. One of the big concerns about um, genetic testing, I mean, primary prevention really should be targeting kids, but the big concern is that providing genetic test results to kids has potential negative effects that we still, again, these are, these are suppositions. We still don't know if those, those really are true. Um, much of the literature says that, that, that it's sort of an on balance that whether or not genetic risk information when you're young influences your life trajectory in terms of your hopes and expectations or um, labels these kids in some ways. But, but we felt that we really couldn't embark on genetic testing with kids before we did some experimental studies to sort of gauge that um, propensity. So we started out with um, thinking about whether or not genetic risk information provided to parents using sort of a communal coping theoretical framework, the idea that moms and parents and people will do things on behalf of loved ones that they wouldn't do for themselves. So you're sort of getting indirect motivation if you're building on that, if you're targeting that relationship. And so here we used moms thinking about getting risk messages about their kids' risk for um, obesity. And we use family history, thinking that that's a relatively, in fact, the pediatric associations recommend that that family history should be done in clinical um, encounters with uh, moms. And, and so here we have a family history risk assessment of whether, based on whether the child has one parent or two parents who are um, overweight. And so what you see here is if the child has one parent, you see that same evidence-based risk um, communication approach. Uh, they have almost a doubling effect of, of the child becoming overweight. Um, and if the, if the child has two parents, it, it quadruples or close to quadruples. So this notion that this is a pretty powerful risk message, much more powerful than our susceptibility variants were in the multiplex project. And th this is currently available. It's not something um, that we have to wait for. So what you see here is that also um, this sort of addresses this issue that there are a lot of challenges for doing uh, translation research, and, and some of the reason I think there's resistance to, the, to doing um, translation research is that, you know, that this, the, the, the ball is moving, that genetic discovery is moving, and we don't know exactly where it's going to wind up, and so we're all kind of hesitating um, to wait for that to happen, that it's very hard to envision some of these future situations, or at least we think it is. Um, I think if we work back from the problem, it isn't so hard to envision, but, um, but it can be and that the concepts that we're trying to deliver, the context that we're trying to work in, are technical and unfamiliar. So how do we get around some of that? Um, and here at NHGRI, uh, Susan Persky, who's in the audience, uh, developed a, a, what we call IVITA, an immersive virtual environment testing area, and we use that to test out, to move us beyond these hypothetical, imagine that you have this um, risk factor, and what would you do, which is terribly imprecise, and, and not very often associated with outcomes, um, actual outcomes. We can improve upon that, and then we can do, use that technology to rigorously evaluate some of our suppositions. And then um, in this case, since we were looking at uh, a behavior like eating or food preparation, we, d we can avoid some of the challenges of trying to do that um, and the in, in, you know, logistical challenges of doing that. So here's the immersive virtual and testing area. Uh, what you see here is our lovely model. Uh, she's wearing a headset um, that is tracked by cameras that are uh, mounted on the wall. We can track her movements all around that all around that room. She's attached to, you can see here, she's attached to the computer, so we can track physiological markers and in addition to the movement. And um, what she's seeing in this case is a buffet that is filled with foods that were selected based on school um, Requi the w slow go woe food public health food recommendations for kids and um, and it has a mix of some of the foods that are slow meaning don't have them very much because they're not really good for you to um, go which are the healthier options have a mix of those and we can track her movements and what she selects her charge would be to fill a plate um, and our aims here are to explore one whether um, concerns that genetic risk information could increase um, and maybe negatively in, in a bad way restrictive parenting practices. If we tell moms that they're at high risk, their kids at high risk, is that going to make them overreact in ways that are going to be um, damaging to the child's eating behaviors, um, which would be the worry, the supposition that these can be harmful. 
Um, we also wanted to evaluate whether providing family history-based, this family history-based risk information would improve, would result in improvements or have any effect on the food choices that the mothers made, all based on calories and the content of this virtual plate. So this is the design of the study. This in here, we're seeing a, an experimental design. So uh, we have, uh, we screened, we recruited healthy volunteers and did a lot of, of uh, sort of announcements around campus and off campus and schools and daycare settings. And um, we had a baseline web survey that sort of screened individuals for the mothers needed to be overweight. Uh, we wanted all of the kids, uh, for all of the kids or all the mothers to get at least one risk information so at least one parent was overweight. We were looking for mothers of children ages four to six so that the children were young enough that it made sense that the mom would be filling a plate for her, for the child. And then they came into the lab. They had to practice the buffet in order to uh, learn. We didn't want any learning effects. So when they're in there filling their plate, they have to know that if you push the gun here, you get how many servings you get and so forth. So that they're, they're skilled at it by the time we're going into the experimental uh, part of the study. So here they're randomized then to food safety information only, so they're just told about how to keep from um, getting food poisoning, so to speak. Behavioral risk information in the second group where they're told all the behavioral risk factors that contribute to a child becoming overweight. And then the third group, it's a combination of that behavioral risk factor information plus a family history risk assessment based on whether there's one biological parent who's overweight or two biological parents who are overweight. Then they do a they do post information survey. Then they go into the buffet, fill the plate, um, and we can measure all the aspects of the plate: the content of the plate, the calories, and so forth, serving sizes. And then we do a post buffet survey. So here you see the results, um, and what what we find here is in terms of the calories on, on the plate is the outcome variable, um, the behavioral risk factor arm compared to the food safety arm. Moms in the behavioral risk arm filled a plate with 35 fewer calories than moms in the, in the food safety group. And that was not significantly different. Moms in the behavioral plus family history arm filled a plate with 45 fewer calories than the, than the, than the um, food safety group. And that was statistically significant, though only at the P less than five level. There were other things that were really interesting in terms of gender of the child and how that influenced, but I'm going to just focus given time on the, on the intervention effects. When we looked at that just amongst the group to see um, what was just look at amongst the group that got the, um, the family history message, what we see is that with two overweight parents, the restriction was, wasn't really happening. That two overweight parents, when, when the mother was in a house, when, her, when the mother was a part of a duo uh, where uh, both parents were overweight, she filled a plate with 71 or almost 72 calories more than if she was the only parent who was contributing to the risk of the, uh, the child's overweight. So there was, a, there was a message coming through that it was the mother's who were being told it's your fault, basically, um, that were restricting, not those that were being, where in a sense the responsibility was being diffused across both of the parents. And when we looked at that to see if that was indeed what was happening across the, the groups, and again, these are very small sample sizes, so this is all very preliminary kind of hypothesis generating research. What you see here is that um, this is the group where, where it was two parents, it was 360 calories on the plate, one parent, 286 calories on the plate. That difference was marginally significant at the 0.05 level. If you go across, and then we see the same thing with sweetened beverages, which also contributes to overweight in childhood, um, where that was more significant, but that 38% two were selecting a sweetened beverage versus 14% for one. And when you look across the groups, you don't see that happening in any of the other groups. So indeed, it was this family history, mom being told it's your, you're the contributing factor here that, was, that was, uh, was causing the restriction. We've done some other analyses and some other papers on guilt and the role of guilt in that, um, and I'll direct you to look at those Kursky publications. Um, but I think the thinking here is, again, the contextualization of that there isn't going to be one reaction to risk communication. There's going to be a complex set of reactions to, those, to our risk communications, and that our thinking about that needs to be guided by theory. 
and, um, and there's going to be a fair amount of nuance in terms of required, in terms of how we communicate these kinds of results. So I think lastly, uh, or the next area in terms of this is thinking about global health. I mean, there's been concerns in terms of the health disparities that what we're discovering won't really reach the poorest um, countries. So the challenge here is to think about how do we, how do, we do um, this kind of research in countries where literacy levels are very low and resources are even lower than they are here in many of our um, poorest public health uh, settings. So uh, we started a project in Ethiopia uh, to look at how we might use genetic information in, in a context that was greatly in need of that um, service. And that was the context of podoconiosis, a condition, a uh, non-filarial elephantiasis uh, that is in highland Ethiopia. It's also in other volcanic areas around the, around the world. Um, but in Ethiopia, there's great poverty and uh, individuals walk long distances, uh, so there's a, a barefoot. So this is a particular uh, problem. What we see here is that it's an inflammatory response to soil irritants, the, the sort of microparticles in the soil that come out of the volcanic uh, rock, and it clusters in families. It's been shown to be genetic. Uh, if you have a sibling, it's your five-fold increased risk of getting the condition. Um, but it's, it's completely preventable if the child protects their feet from the soil and wears footwear consistently. 50% of the population are under the age of 15, so providing shoes to everyone, which would be the logical solution, everyone can benefit from foot protection. There's no infrastructure to do that. So this idea of targeting those at high risk is one that is being bandied about in many other areas, conditions. That's what we're doing in, in cancer at public health level um, is something that we need to think about. So uh, targeting shoes to those at high risk is what we were thinking about doing. And we were working with, at the, tom, at the time, Tom Shoes, who was providing shoes to these high-risk kids. Um, so we s embarked on some pilot data. Uh, the big issue here was that these families are highly stigmatized. Uh, once, a, once a family member shows that they have this condition, people, uh, they're banned from, from group functions. They are, can't go to church. They can't, they, people won't marry into their families. So very high level of stigma. And when we started talking with the community organizations, there was great resistance to the notion that we would introduce we would confirm what everybody already believed, which was that it was genetic. Because by confirming that, we would only exacerbate um, the stigma and that there wasn't really a belief that we could actually characterize this as a gene-environment interaction and, and really diminish or lower stigma. Not a lot of belief in that. So we started out looking at um, the study sites in a qualitative methodology. So we did uh, a very large qualitative effort over about three year period where we looked at different sites in these rural Ethiopian areas, I'm sorry, um, and looked at num large numbers of individuals partly because there was such high rates of volunteering that we couldn't turn people away. Um, so these were different sites that, these were the numbers of cases in those sites. This was the duration of relationship, so we wanted to vary that with the NGO that was distributing Tom's shoes to the, to the kids. And then we also wanted those that were more and less remote, so varying these different communities to find out what some of the beliefs were. We did 28 focus groups and 38 individuals, lots of, we had 307 participations. This is a uh, qualitative effort on steroids. Most of them don't look like this. So what we found out in our qualitative, I'm just gonna cut to the chase here, was that if the individuals in the community believed that it was heredity that was contributing to POTO, um, they, they, they diminished their beliefs, they decreased their beliefs that it would be important to, to do anything preventive because it couldn't be prevented. And they were much more likely to endorse stigmatizing behaviors. And that that was actually associated with their beliefs about wanting more distance from individuals who had this condition. They weren't willing to marry into these, and they also, if they were affected, they stigmatized themselves and thought they, they themselves were less worthy. But they also were, there also was a lot of belief that it was contagious and that it was not hereditary, but, uh, but sort of contagious in the sense that it was, or hereditary in the sense that contagion would happen in the home amongst family members. So in those cases, they would, they thought that shoes might be okay, they might be greater importance, and they had more, um, empathy for the patients, but they were, they were so worried about contagion that, that, that it still contributed to stigma. They didn't want to be around these families. They didn't want to marry into them, and, they didn't, and if they had it, they still f felt stigmatized. 
Um, so, we, so what you tend to do then when you do this qualitative is you identify the themes and then you go in with a quantitative survey to verify that in fact what you've picked up in this qualitative methodology really bears truth at the population level. So we did a survey with 1,100 um, unaffected family members, uh, unaffected households, and um, almost 600 affected households to look and see if in fact these, these were prevalent beliefs. And what you see here is that these differences, the yellow being the affected, those who come from families with podoconiosis, and the, the, the gray bars being those who don't come from those households. And what you see across the board is that our findings in the qualitative research were largely substantiated, and you also see that there were quite large differences in the unaffected households, where the unaffected households really looked like they were the ones that would benefit the most from an intervention. So without that qualitative work and the quantitative paired up together, the mixed methods approach is what we call it, we might have not done the intervention targeted to the unaffected individuals. We also saw that in terms of stigma, that um, the individuals, that, that our quantitative results did validate that there was stigma, uh, feelings of stigma, 40% feeling ashamed, inferior, and that people were distancing them. Likewise, the unaffected families were, were endorsing at fairly large levels that they were engaging in stigmatizing behaviors. So again, another sort of endorsement that if we just targeted the effectives with the education around gene environment interactions of contributors to this condition, we would miss a big element of the problem. So what we did is we um, launched a, what I'm going to call a quasi-experimental design st study to evaluate what they were doing in usual care. So it's also kind of comparative effectiveness approach, what they were already doing in usual care to two other interventions, um, a household skills building around how to wear shoes, why it's important to wear shoes, and boosters to encourage them to do that, and then um, adding inherited susceptibility or not as, a, as an educational tool. And our two outcomes were, were they wearing in the prior seven days um, shoes every day? And um, how much experienced or enacted stigma, depending on the population, or whether they were affected or unaffected, they were engaging in. Um, we selected affected households using, again, population-based strategies, the ledgers that they had, the NGO had, um, and then identifying at random 100 households from each site. There were six sites. An adult um, had that had to be to be eligible. The household had to have an adult who had an index child that was in this age group to participate in the study. And then we identified two neighboring households uh, within 500 meters of the of the affected household. They had a child in the target age. There was nobody in the household who had a blood relative with podoconiosis, and there there somebody some adult who said they were the cared for the child in that household was willing to participate. So the six communities, I call it a quasi-experimental. There's a lot of debate about this. It was randomization, but there were six, six um, communities, so an N of six. Um, and you'll see that randomization doesn't always work very well in those situations. And there were a lot of factors that we couldn't control, obviously. The three arms were what they were currently doing, uh, which was just an on-site when the shoes were being distributed, an on-site education just to the affected households. So those two um, those six or those two communities got just the, that intervention that were randomized. Household-based skills training uh, with lay health advisors who went out to the households and trained them on how to wh why it was important to wear shoes and how to wear shoes, and then a public a public health campaign, which I'll show you a little bit of in a minute, um, to reinforce that message throughout the Cabe what they call cabeles, and then um, the the two groups got this household-based skills, plus the um, inherited soil sensitivity education. So this was a six-month intervention. There was a booster session about midpoint. Um, as I said, we did posters. We had a local musician that did, uh, wrote a song that we played on a, on a van that we drove around through the Cabeles. Uh, we had the, the lay health advisors going out to the households. We, these are the kinds of posters that were out there about really with the message being wear shoes everywhere all the time, no matter what you're doing. Um, and the big thing for the genetic susceptibility was this gene environment interaction and trying to, because as I said, the, the concerns about stigma was so pronounced. So what we did is we wanted to normalize this, ex, this sort of susceptibility. So we used the metaphor of sun exposure. These individuals walk long distances in the sun. There's no tree coverage in Highland Ethiopia. 
And what you see in the walking, in the people that are walking, is that some folks are walking bareheaded, don't seem to be bothered at all by the sun. Some people have head wraps, some people carry umbrellas. And there's no, there's no judgments or stigma that is associated with any of that, but it's reflecting a sensitivity, uh, a difference or a variation in sensitivity that we wanted to play up as this is the foot exposure is the same thing. Uh, that resonated very well in our pilot testing. And then what we did was sort of an additive model, which I think is fairly unsophisticated, but a good place to start. Um, an additive model of gene environment interaction where basically using a method that's been um, tested before, a, a jar of marbles where your susceptibility fills the marble, fills the jar up to a certain point, so it takes less exposure to fill that jar totally. That would be an additive model. We used that, but we took people. So here we have basically essentially these jars. If you have, just by being exposed, which is the red sort of area, you're getting, ex you have some risk, but if you have the susceptibility, you have even more risk. And that really all you have to do, and there is another figure here, is put shoes on and it's like the umbrella. It protects you from this exposure. So here are the outcomes, as you can see, for our main outcome was affected observed shoe wearing. And what we have here is the three groups, the baseline, and this is where I think it's always nice to say it was quasi-experimental. Baseline shoe wearing in the usual care group was 51%. You compare baseline shoe wearing, and this is just the health behaviors, 31%, uh, uh, and in the gene environment, 32%. So um, this was just a fluke of who we, uh, the groups we selected. Then what we calculated at each of the follow-up points was the change. So the change in shoe wearing between the baseline and the three-month follow-up. So in this usual care group, there was a de decrease of shoe wearing, but there were increases in shoe wearing in the other two groups, um, but not significant increases. And likewise, same thing, increases across. So no effect on observed shoe fit wearing in the affected um, individuals. Was marginally significant, I would say no. Um, so affected experience stigma, what we see here is baseline levels of stigma in the usual care group, uh, up about 1.78, higher in the HB group to begin with and higher in the GE group to begin with. So again, another fluke of this randomization thing. Decreases in stigma across the board from, for each of the groups, slightly, uh, not really no difference there either. Um, and that would have been experienced stigma reported. But when we get to the unaffected individuals, what we see here is more uh, same baseline levels of stigma and then decreasing again stigma across the board, but a higher decrease in stigma here. Again, marginally significant, but um, suggestive of the fact, and I think the most important thing to hear is did it, the point of it significantly decreasing stigma really isn't the issue. It didn't increase stigma, and that was the big concern. So it didn't produce the harm that was worried about. Another supposition that um, fell aside when the data was brought to it. Obviously, we need to do more testing, but I think what it says is that we can shape these messages in ways that will benefit health. We don't have to assume that, um, that behavioral science can bring that kind of information to these shapings. So the last little area I want to talk about is um, the sort of precision medicine kind of notions of, stand, of customizing um, intervention design, the sort of notion that we're all zebras and that we need to move away from these one-size treatments and, and look at individual characteristics. And like I said, that has been characterized largely as precision medicine, but there are some of those out there who are saying, let's think about this in terms of public health. How do, what implications does improving the sort of specificity or, the, or moving away from one size fits all, what does that have um, for public health? So, you know, it's no, it's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here to say that health behaviors are a major problem and that, um, that they don't seem to be getting any better. We don't see, despite all of our public health efforts being directed at these health behaviors, we're not seeing uh, that our interventions are really making a big difference. And I think that many of us believe that that is at least in part because we're not, we're ignoring individual variability um, in how people respond to both our messages and to our intervention approaches. And we can see here the problems are, are really intractable. I mean, we still have, even if we get people to change their behaviors, we get people to quit smoking, 
relapse rates are 80 percent, uh, even if we get people to lose weight, they gain it back. So we're really, we, it, it's not to be fatalistic, it's just that we really do have a lot, have a lot of work that we could be doing. And again, the question is, does this new genomic discovery bring anything to that challenge and that problem? Um, I'm going to skip this. I think it's just basically the point is that there's um, a lot, if we look at intervention trials, people drop out of intervention trials for lots of reasons that I think point to their individual challenges in trying to accomplish our goals. And it's interesting that, you know, when we think about public health messages around weight loss, for example, what we see is that it's sort of a energy in, energy out kind of stupid. Um, here's what you do. It, you know, you can take into account um, that there's lots of contextual factors here, but, but largely we ignore that what we're learning and from genomic discovery is that there's lots of genetic variants suggesting individual differences in this, in this equation. So in our response to calorie restriction, appetite control, eating in the absence of hunger, and uh, also how we respond to physical activity, whether it gives us the mood boost or not, how if we overheat and so forth. So lots of individual variation that has to be considered in the context of other public health challenges. Like we don't want to say, well, gee, it doesn't matter that you're in a food desert. That's not the point. But it's a gene environment kind of interaction. And there have been some folks who've been doing some thinking about this. My favorite is Angela Bryant. She continues to do these models of thinking about how we would customize interventions and what we need to learn about um, how people respond to exercise before we can start to tailor those or as part of tailoring those. So what her arguments are is that if you take something like exercise behavior and you back up from that, we all, you know, I've told you a little bit about motivation and the importance of motivation, but that underlying motivation is a lot of what, how people subjectively experience what it is they're being asked to do and how they respond to it physically. And that all of those have genetic influences. And in fact, more and more, we're even considering that exercise is going to have epigenetic influences on some of these things. So it's bi-directional and should be considered. And there's some examples of this, um, older studies that have been done in terms of looking at whether or not um, individuals who are exposed, who we know are exposed to the same intervention, in this case it's a Japanese study, um, looking at women who have a common variant versus a risk variant in this trip. 64R polymorphism and uh, involved in appetite control and weight loss. And what you see here is that if they have the common variant, it looks like they are, they walk this, they, they restrict their calories and they get a nice, um, you know, nice correlation here of loss of weight. And if they, whereas those who have the risk variant, we don't see that same association. So that there is some validation of this notion that what people are telling us is I'm doing what you told me to do and it's not working for me. That there's probably some truth to that and maybe we shouldn't be ignoring that as gee you're just not working hard enough or it's just a sort of the Protestant ethic approach. Similarly we see this with um, exercise, the same sorts of things. This is Angela's study where it's BDNF um, looking at uh, the two different variants, small samples. These are, again, hypothesis generating, in my opinion. Um, you're looking at whether an individual from a controlled exercise session on a bicycle, everything being under control, you see that some individuals are getting, um, are working harder for less positive affect, or they're getting less positive affect from the full session, and they're working harder to get it. So again, we see this sense of validating that perhaps we should be, like pharmacogenomics, applying those same principles to our behavior change interventions. Similarly, I think one of the things that's really interesting from the relapse prevention standpoint, again, these are, I think probably, I mean, my colleagues even at, at Emory sort of say, ah, these are kind of, they're small studies, you know, they're probably methodologically challenged. Yeah, they are. Um, again, I think that doesn't, doesn't mean we don't keep trying to figure out, make, make the studies more rigorous, make the sample sizes larger, improve the science, but ask the question. And in this case, this is a nutrigenomics, sort of modeling on the pharmacogenomics. And this is, was done in Greece, very small study again, um, looking at people who had failed at repeated weight loss attempts, which is really most of us, <laughs> and, and looking at patients and controls, and customizing the dietary recommendations based on 19 genes across seven categories, all that were amenable to intervention so we could make a precise uh, recommendation uh, on their nutritional advice. And what they found was, which I think is very interesting, is no effect in the short term. 
So maybe motivation is really all you need in the beginnings of an intervention. But it isn't what keeps you able to sustain those changes afterwards. And that maybe that's where customization, because you can see here where the diet started, the customized diet started to distinguish itself was after, was in the longer term. So maybe it's the customization is going to help us with, with relapse prevention, not so much with the initial treatment outcomes. And all of this, again, I say this is very, these are small studies. I want to have a lot of caveats. I don't think that this is the greatest science yet. But everything that we do is going to have to be put into the model of some kind of comparative effectiveness. So these are studies that take time. They take resources. And if we don't start doing it sooner, we're going to really be up against a situation like what I showed in the beginning, where we've got uh, rolling out new applications that we have no idea of whether or not they work or not. And I think we should, we have the, the knowledge and the power to avoid that outcome. So the take home messages are that I think we should be doing translation research now in step with basic science discovery, that there are lots of ways to do that, lots of ideas. I gave you just some, some examples from my own work, um, but there are lots of other people out there doing really exciting stuff as well that we have lots of conceptual models, lots is the key word here, and um, that, that we have to think about uh, practicability um, to guide our research questions and where are the big problems and where is the discovery going to match, bringing that match together early um, and using our full armamentarium of methods. And obviously, we have to work together as interdisciplinary teams, basic scientists, social and behavioral scientists, this is the environment to be doing that. You guys are the leaders in the field, and you should be setting um, the example for doing that. So thanks to my colleagues who helped in this uh, work and um, our collaborators and friends and um, co-authors. Co and um, you can reach me. I want to put a plug in for the social and behavioral research branch. It's uh, alive and well and doing great. Um, but if you want to reach me, I'm at Emory now, and there's my address. So thank you very much for your attention.